It's time to introduce our main speaker, Julia Ross, on her subject of sugar addiction, defeating the greatest dietary crisis of all time. But before I do, uh, next month's speaker is Ron Rothenberg. For those of you who don't know who he is, an MD from uh, between Sandia and Sanita, California, who is probably one of the top people in the world on hormones, um, um, thyroid, and related areas. And he, um, when he speaks at the A4M conventions, speaks 12 hours at about three different times. And he is the, the long, I guess they, they give him uh, the longest programs on sometimes three or four different subjects. Anyway, he's gonna be speaking um, next month on combination of the subjects I just mentioned. And in September, we have Dr. T coming back. And uh, in October, we have Steve Blake, who's going to talk about Alzheimer's again, uh, referring to the work of uh, Mary Newport and some differences of opinion he has on that approach. Anyway, introducing Julia Ross now. Uh, she has founded and directed seven programs treating eating disorders, addictions, and mood problems in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1980. At the Recovery Systems Clinic founded in 1988, Ross and her clinical team have developed an innovative treatment model internationally recognized for its successful nutrient therapy and biochemical rebalancing strategies. Thousands of former overeaters can attest to the effectiveness of these methods, which Ross spells out in her new diet cure, just released in a 40% updated edition. Ross has taught at several San Francisco Bay universities and presented at hundreds of professional conferences internationally. In fact, she was at the Commonwealth Club last Thursday and had 120 people show up. She has been featured in many publications from the Journal of Molecular Psychiatry to Vogue magazine. Her numerous media appearances include an NBC special on a successful nutritional approach to depression. Ross's books have sold over 200,000 copies in four languages. She trains and certifies clinicians in the U.S. and abroad through the Neutro Neuronutrient Therapy Institute. Are you ready? Hi, this is Pam. I would like to just give you a, a few minutes uh, uh, to, of experience that I have had with Julia Ross, and I'd like to talk to you all about it. I had a little niece at the time. She was 12 years old. She was addicted to street drugs. So bad. It was the worst drug, a street drug on the market until she was 23, 24 years old. Her parents took her everywhere, and nobody could help her. My sister in Arizona called me and asked me if I could help her, and I said, gee, the only one I can think of is Julia Ross. You, you have to get her up here. Well, we went in to see Julia Ross, and I was totally impressed. I stayed with her for every visit. I never saw a woman, a, 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 a girl, come out of what she did, and now she's a lovely lady with the thanks, of, thanks from Julia Ross and all the help and all the faith and, and trust that she gave me that I didn't think I had. I didn't think I could do it because it was a tough call. 
And Judy, Julia gave me the confidence that said that I can do it and work with her. And I was very impressed. And I couldn't have done it without Julia's help. Julia was the one that pulled my niece out of it. She, she is drug free and it's been about six years now. So I wanted to share that with you. And if you didn't get any of her books, you really should consider it because I have them both and they're the one of the most, both of them are the most powerful books. And now, and now she's got the new revised edition, which is even more powerful. And what a gift to give somebody that you know that needs the help like I did. Thank you. Those of you who don't know me uh, probably don't know that I've been working in the addiction treatment field since 1973. And uh, when I began, uh, I was treating alcoholism. I was among the first psychotherapists attempting to treat alcoholism um, before there was rehab. Um, a whole industry developed to treat addiction. Um, we thought initially that we were going to be very successful. We were wildly excited. We were using all of the techniques that we were learning, um, the new clinical psychology techniques, uh, very exciting work. Um, when the first relapse studies was done, we learned that with alcoholics we were getting a 50 percent success rates, which depressed us no end. We were convinced that we were going to eradicate the problem. But that began to look very, very good about six months into the crack epidemic when we had 100% relapse within 24 hours after the addicts leaving the most intensive inpatient programs in the country. And somewhere between 50 and 100% relapse is what's going on now. Um, most honest program directors will admit to 90% relapse rates. And I assume that if they admit to 90%, it's probably worse. So I was highly motivated to find another way. As brokenhearted as I was about the failure of psychotherapy. Fortunately for me, there were a few pioneers, one of them from the state of Washington, an MD named Milam, who wrote a book called Under the Influence, where he talked about treating alcoholism as a uh, glucose intolerance disease and having tremendous success um, with dietary recovery approaches, uh, leveling blood sugar, uh, eliminating hypoglycemia, and the tremendous cravings that that alcoholics have um, because of their genetic intolerance to refined carbohydrates. They really um, must have dietary support. So that was very exciting. And I, just having been named the director of the outpatient program, uh, immediately started hiring nutritionists. And after six years, we had two successful cases. Two successful cases in that these women were able to follow our dietary advice. What about all the other clients that we had? Were they poorly motivated? Uh, were they ignorant? Were we just not doing a good job of education? Absolutely not. Highly motivated, understood the value of the dietary approach, but absolutely unable to implement it. When I put this failure, together with the fact that in the inpatient program, it was standard, and it was true all over the field 
for people to gain 30 pounds in the first 30 days of recovery by substituting sugar for the alcohol and or drugs um, that they had been addicted to. Even so, I didn't see it as an addiction. I did not see food as an addictive substance until one of my own employees came to me and asked me to go to an Overeaters Anonymous meeting with her. And I began to understand a little bit about what food addicts were up against. That was in the early 1980s. It was beginning to go out of control. Uh, food addiction, particularly sugar addiction, was becoming um, more and more common and virulent. Um, but at this point, I think you all know that um, our diet uh, has become almost completely void of nutritional value. But more than that, um, it's replete with with toxic effects. Um, and I'm going to talk about, um, I'm here, and I um, completely revised my first book, The Diet Cure, in honor of the 21st century epidemics of overeating, obesity, and degenerative disease resulting from it. Now, one of the things that I want to say to you in particular, because all of you are extraordinarily open-minded and forward-thinking, is that um, I actually want you to think a different way tonight with me. I want you to think about how we ate before 1970. It's going to be a lot of the emphasis of my talk tonight. So how many people here remember what we were eating and what we were like prior to 1970? OK, this is a, a well-represented group here. However, when I speak in other places, uh, I have the following experiences. Um, I mentioned three squares uh, in a, a book signing in uh, Sonoma County and asked if there was anyone present who didn't know what I was talking about. All kinds of, of uh, people under 30 uh, had no idea. One, one guy said, do you mean three geeks? <laughs> so um, the foundation of, of my talk tonight um, and, and my approach uh, to sugar addiction uh, and its eradication is founded on the fact that we were eating a diet that was relatively moderate in its sugar content up until 1970. We had no obesity. We had very little overweight. We had very little degenerative disease, although it had been increasing as our diet had deteriorated. But for example, in 1911, um, there was no heart disease. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the statement of uh, Dudley White, uh, who wrote the first textbook on heart disease in 1930. Uh, in his introduction, he said, I'm writing this book for the relatively small number of people with heart disease now, but when I went to medical school in 1911, graduated in 1911, there was no heart disease. We just didn't see it. We didn't treat it. So, when we think about all the new things and our excitement about the new things, um, I want you to stop. Um, I've had to stop. I was uh, a passionate uh, experimenter uh, as well, and I still am in a lot of ways, but um, we, we've, we've got the information that we need. We know what kind of diets we need to protect ourselves, protect our weights, protect our health. Our problem is that we can't, the food's available, but we can't eat it. Because, as I'll explain, the hardwired biochemical addiction that has been 
designed and delivered to us by the refined food industry. Um, someone that we don't usually regard as a friend, uh, David Kessler, um, the uh, former chief of the FDA, uh, actually wrote one of the most important books uh, published in the last five years called The End of Overeating. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the book, but David was a, a compulsive eater lifelong. He owned a suit in every size. And when he left the FDA, his friends had collected funds to allow him to research his passion, which was to understand why he could never get his weight under control, why he could never get his diet under control for any length of time. So I, um, I particularly encourage you to look at it because not only does he um, document the dynamics of, of uh, sugar addiction very, very well, um, but he talks, uh, he quotes the chiefs of Kellogg's and General Mills and so forth, talking about what's happened with him. Uh, I, I remember one chilling quote uh, where one, you know, gigantic uh, industry leader said, um, well, it's, it's too bad. It looks like the very thing we've figured out that's making us all this money is the very same thing that's destroying America's health. So, keep your mind strictly focused on the past, <laughs> just for tonight. Uh, now, let's see if I can make this work. Um, in honor of the progressed um, disaster, dietary disaster that has uh, that is overtaking us. Um, I contacted my publisher who had originally uh, published the Diet Cure in 1999 when there was no announced obesity epidemic. That's how quickly this has evolved. There was certainly no childhood obesity epidemic at that time. Um, so I contacted my publisher and I said, I have not revised the Diet Cure. Over 100,000 people uh, on this and other continents have read it. Um, I have just been contacted by a Frenchman who wants to translate into French out of his extraordinary gratitude for finally finding something that would um, assist him in his lifelong struggle with obesity. Um, and I don't want him writing something that's no longer relevant. So I got their permission to revise the book. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized that 12 years had passed and my clinic and I had developed all kinds of techniques that were even better than the ones that we had in 1998 when I wrote The Diet Cure originally. And so I sent them back the manuscript with a 40% revision and they were enraged. This is a very expensive proposition and authors just don't do this apparently. They're required to change 25% of a book to call it revised, but in fact, most people don't do that and the publishers look the other way because of the expense. They actually ended up charging me $2,000, uh, $3,000 um, for part of the expenses of uh, inputting all these changes. And I'm saying this to you uh, very seriously that even if you have the original book, throw it away. Um, it's terribly important that you have the most updated information because this is the battle of our lives. Oops. Uh, uh, because of this, um, uh, our children really, um, really uh, don't have much hope at this moment. Um, Almost all children are addicted to sugar, um, and we'll find out why. Um, and the price tag is this. We've gone from a planet whose primary problem with malnutrition was starvation, frank starvation, famine, to a country where the, to a globe whose primary malnutrition problem is uh, reflected in high calorie um, nutrient void foods. Um, and the results are, as you see, 
um, disfigurement, un, unprecedented disfigurement. Um, and um, in addition to the overeating and obesity, um, the epidemics of diabetes and other degenerative diseases, specifically heart disease, kidney disease, cancer, um, related to our diet, uh, strictly related to our diet. And in addition to that, depression, anxiety, the other uh, epidemics, uh, including overstress uh, and things like ADHD, insomnia, and fatigue. And I could go on and on and on. But I want to remind you again that before 1970, we didn't experience this. None of this. We were not experiencing this. Because we were eating something like the traditional human diet on the planet. Um, whole foods. Uh, our soils admittedly deteriorating. Um, chemical pollutants, of course, but we were still very, very different in literally very different shape before 1970. Um, it took me uh, quite some time to find unattractive images of our current diet. <laughs> I, really, the, the webmaster would, uh, he's, he's come to me with all kinds of gorgeous images, donuts with these beautiful frosting, you know, art pieces, you know, and I couldn't get it through to him. No, I want ugly. <laughs> we need something appropriate to the topic. Um, so. We'll, we'll s we're going to go into great detail about these kinds of, of uh, foods, but since we're eating uh, this non-food, this toxic uh, stuff um, here, and we're exporting it worldwide, the World Health Organization has become extremely alarmed um, because of the progression of degenerative illness uh, all over the world. And they um, convened a summit um, in, um, in two about 2000. Um, and made a report in 2006. The summit was designed, an international summit, to make recommendations about what can we do to prevent this, these epidemics of ill health from overtaking us. What are the recommendations of this organization going to be to the world to turn it around? And they came up with one. That was it. This is, um, how many of you saw this, this report? Nobody. I found it on page six of the New York Times. It was this big. When I've been in Europe, all of the European com countries had it, first front page news. And uh, apparently that was true all over the world, where the World Health Organization has a hearing, but not in this country because the Sugar Council um, suppressed it. However, we have a local hero, uh, Robert Lustig. Um, how many of you have not heard of Robert Lustig? Um, well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to tell you about uh, a uh, pediatric oncologist at UCSF who figured out sometime in the last 10 years that his children were um, being made ill uh, by sugar, which is the number one uh, food for cancer cells. And um, he became enraged. And he's a very uh, solid, strong, articulate fellow. And uh, you can see some of his talks on YouTube, uh, USF Talks. Um, but he didn't get the attention of the country because of the Sugar Council. So he went to the UK um, just this year in February. They published his study, um, well, his, an article. Um, that he wrote with some colleagues from UCSF, Is Sugar Toxic? Um, and he's the one who's behind uh, all of the excitement about regulating sugar, about not allowing children access to it the way we don't allow them access to alcohol or tobacco. Uh, so um, he's a big help. Um, and there's a great deal of alarm now about sugar, a lot of buzz about sugar. Whoops. Um, very specifically, um, he, he says that 35 million deaths worldwide are directly attributed to sugar consumption. 
And I wanted to add that the most deadly of all addictive substances that we knew about until just now was tobacco, which kills 5.3 million people a year. So again, is it ignorance? Is there anyone here, who, especially here, who doesn't know that eliminating sugar from the diet is, would be a healthful and um, weight stabilizing move? No. <laughs> Lack of motivation. Uh, I think diabetes is a wonderful motivator, but one of my early nutritionists was married to a surgeon at the VA who came home and told her that the same patients whose feet he had amputated the week before were rolling their wheelchairs down to the candy machine the following week. This is a powerful, powerful dynamic. It has nothing to do with, with being informed or being motivated. Um, and of course, the fact that there's so much great PR and we think that, that sweets are so cute uh, doesn't help. Um, talk about a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, so in terms of, of uh, solutions, I just want to very, you know, in a few seconds eliminate any possibility in your minds, I'm a psychotherapist, that psychotherapy is a valuable option when it comes to compulsive eating of sugar. Um, the theories about emotional overeating, filling the void, <coughs> self-destructive eating, and so forth. Um, completely miss the point, which is that there's a biochemical tragedy occurring. And um, anyone who has tried to treat someone with psychotherapy uh, has found it to be an exercise in futility, just as treating any addiction is an exercise in futility. Um, many, many years ago, psychotherapists, psychiatrists gave up on treating alcoholism, for example, and said, uh, we don't know what to do. You know, we don't know what to recommend because this doesn't work. Um, uh, those of you who, who are um, <coughs> aware of the awareness solutions to uh, compulsive eating, conscious eating, mindful eating, intuitive eating, I had a, uh, a call from a, a journalist who was interviewing me about this, and she said, what do you think about um, mindful eating? She was clearly intrigued. Mindfulness is so au courant. Um, and I said, well, I think it's very similar to uh, mindful uh, heroin use, <laughs> which is why I have the hypodermic in this image. Um, so I want to share with you what are the universally accepted definitions of addiction. And here they are. Loss of control, continued use despite adverse consequences, withdrawal symptoms, relapse, progressive and terminal uh, dynamic. Um, does anyone have any trouble thinking of, of sugar consumption in those terms? Um, so I want to let that sink in. Um, and, and then I'd like to, you, to tell me which pile of white powder is sugar. <laughs> There's a hint there. Um, the point is that uh, a sugar beet is an entirely different thing than these, this pile of white powder in terms of its impact on the brain in particular. Just as a cocoa leaf is quite different than the white powder cocaine. Um, our um, hard science uh, kicked in anew uh, in 2007 uh, with a study showing that sugar and sugar substitutes Whose, whose use is going up astronomically as people are becoming more afraid of sugar uh, just in the last few months. Um, so sugar and sugar substitutes four times more addictive than cocaine. Um, four times more addictive. Does that help explain why we have all these epidemics? Um, in the 80s, actually, um, the Wirt um, husband and wife team, Judith and Richard Wortman, studied the effect of sugar uh, in, in terms of our serotonin function and found that um, 
every time we consumed sugar, insulin rose and insulin wiped everything out of the bloodstream except the nutrient that was required by the brain to make serotonin. That serotonin got into the brain without any competition from other amino acids and, other, and vitamins, minerals, and fats uh, that were um, uh, plunged into, into the muscle. Um, in addition to that, multiple studies talk about sugar being an op like an opiate, having the same effect on opiate chemistry in the brain. Um, our natural heroin levels are activated by it, the endorphins. Um, many, many studies, including by Nora Volkow, the head of uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, talk about the dopamine effect uh, of sugar. Uh, and she and her well-funded studies are all looking for a drug solution to a drug addiction. Good luck. <laughs> I think all of us know that when blood sugar levels drop, we get an out-of-control craving for junk food. Anybody ever gone to the store when it was too late? Um, it had been too long since you'd eaten, and you got to the, to the register with some good stuff, and then you bought the candy because you couldn't wait. That's hypoglycemia, and that is known uh, to play a huge part in compulsive eating. Since people are not eating meals anymore, and they are certainly not eating three meals anymore, hypoglycemia is the order of the day. Now, um, I'm going to talk about this again, but um, it's very important that you, you understand, and that I understand, we all understand, that there are powerful addictive factors at play that we had no idea about. So we know now that these powerful neurotransmitters are impacted and controlled by sugar, but it turns out that there are other powerful appetite regulators that are um, dysregulated by sugar, and I'll talk about what they are and, and how in a minute. Um, the, uh, the healthy brain is replete. It has all of the neurotransmitter sites, uh, producing sites are filled. Um, an addictive brain, um, sorry, is empty. There just aren't enough neurotransmitters to send out positive messages, so you've got to use drug substances like sugar to cause a brief activation and stimulation in that department so that we feel sort of normal, sort of like the well-being that we were naturally intended to, to have. Um, so what are the addictive foods? Um, table sugar, sucrose from, you know, cane or beet. Um, is half glucose and half fructose, and they're combined, uh, they're tied together. So it's a little bit hard to separate the glucose from the fructose. Certainly, a little, it takes a little longer than it does um, for the, the body to process high fructose corn syrup, which has more fructose uh, than glucose, and there is no binding between the two, so that both the glucose and the, and the fructose hit us very hard. And I'll talk in a little bit about what that means. Um, so what about starches, refined starches? Um, they're sugars too, right? The, uh, the enzymes in the mouth convert starch to glucose in seconds. Um, so we get the spike and the neurotransmitter uh, buzz uh, from starch as well as from, from sugar. Um, chocolate, any uh, question about that, the addictiveness of chocolate and one of the more complex drugs on earth and uh, uh, well known for its ability to kill dogs. Um, anybody here not know about that? Uh, um, uh, gluten containing foods uh, can be highly addictive uh, to many people. Uh, they're known as comfort foods, doughy things, right? pasta, pizza, bread, um, and I'll explain in a little bit how that works. 
casein, one of the proteins in, in uh, milk products, has a similar highly addictive effect on the brain for many people, and that's why um, mac and cheese uh, is so popular. We've got a double whammy there. Um, and finally, fat is intended to be attractive to us. Uh, some people can get hard drug addicted to fats, but not nearly the number of people that get addicted to carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, sweets, and starches. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, <laughs> 2012 might be the end of high fructose corn syrup. There's certainly a lot of uh, momentum against it, but we are up against a, uh, a commercial issue, which is that it's a lot cheaper in this country than sugar. Um, in other countries in the world, they're not using it because sugar is very cheap. Um, but uh, there's a lot of motivation to use high fructose corn syrup, but why not? Um, we don't want to use it because there's something about it. Uh, it's increased uh, since its introduction in 1970. It's increased U.S. sweets and cake by 25% and soda intake by 135%. So it contains at least 5% uh, percent more fructose in this unbound free form than sucrose does. I, I don't want to make it seem like sucrose is some wonderful thing, um, but I do want to talk about how the sucrose is 50% um, fructose, 50% glucose. The body knows how to handle glucose. It does not know how to handle the, the volume of fructose that it's getting now. Um, so why, what's the problem with fructose, whether it comes from high fructose corn syrup or, or from um, uh, sucrose? Um, it's uh, twice as sweet as glucose, um, and it produces equal amounts of triglycerides, only the triglycerides last in the body for almost 24 hours. So when we talk about heart disease and our diet, it, it looks like fructose plays an enormous role. Um, it's it's uh, the fatty liver syndrome is uh, due to, to excessive ingestion of fructose. Fructose is processed in the liver. Uh, it has a unique um, uh, way of being uh, processed in the body. Uh, and partly because of that, um, it's, it's a unique way of being processed. It has three more addictive potentials than than glucose. So here we go with these satiety hormones. Um, insulin. Insulin is not released after an infusion of fructose. The body does not know that we have ingested an enormous gob of sweetener. So we keep on eating. We don't get the message. Insulin actually helps us to stop eating. When insulin levels rise, we feel there's a, just a sensation of, I guess we, don't, we shouldn't be eating anymore. Um, leptin is another um, appetite suppressant that is not activated by fructose, so the body doesn't know again what's happening. So the addictive momentum. Um, and finally, it stimulates ghrelin, which is a hormone that increases our appetite. So we're learning more and more about just exactly how we're getting addicted here. Okay, so remember that our goal is to eat traditional food. So if you know, if you happen to know what your great-grandmother uh, served, eat it. Um, a lot of us don't know, but some of us do. Um, I had a woman come to me. Um, uh, spoke up at a, at a lecture I gave at Sonoma State, and she said she was from Nicaragua, and she was, again, tremendous weight gain since she got to this country, and she'd been on a lot of diets, and she was fed up with it, and she was going to go on a monitored fast of 400 calories. And I said, please, before you do that, tell me one thing. Um, do you visit, do you go back to Nicaragua? And she said, yes. And I said, well, when you go back, do you continue to gain weight? And she said, oh, no, I lose weight. I always lose weight when I go home. And I said, well, um, do you restrict? I mean, do you try and starve yourself so that you'll lose weight before you come home? No. Uh, and I said, well, could you eat those same foods in this country? And she said, yes. And I said, please do. Uh, 
it never occurred to her. That's how effective our PR is. You know, the glamour of our food knows no bounds. Um, and the addictiveness knows no bounds. Um, so um, there is another factor that, that kicked in in the 70s. Um, and it had to do with our falling in love with a non-traditional body type. Hardly anybody looked like Twiggy. But I can tell you that we thought we, we were gorgeous. Uh, m most of us were about the same size as, as our idols, you know, Marilyn and so forth. Um, and we were a, a country of very confident women. Um, and when we started dieting, it was just for fun. It was just like when we wore bustles or did other weird things, you know, fashion things. Um, but this is the kind of um, f fun we used to have being ourselves and not trying to be a shape that was totally inappropriate. Um, the price tag for our low calorie dieting has been immense and silent. Um, but it's one of the reasons I wrote the diet cure and called it the diet cure because I wanted a cure for the scourge, uh, the, the, the voluntary famine that is low calorie dieting. And uh, it's completely unsuccessful as a long term uh, weight loss technique, right? Anybody have any question about how successful it's been over the years? Um, in fact, everybody gains more weight than they ever needed to lose in the first place. Um, and uh, it increases our appetite and our overeating and slows down our metabolism so that we are absolutely doomed to more weight gain. It's a great industry. So this is another reminder. Um, please don't fall for modern diets. Keep in mind that one of the very earliest pioneers in inventing a new wonderful diet was Kellogg. So uh, there are two chapters in the diet here on this dynamic. I really want you to become aware because we are doing new dieting now, right? A lot of people don't do formal diets anymore. Most people don't anymore. They are just under eating all the time. It's low fat, low cal as much as possible, skipping meals, cleansing, fasting, um, basically restricting in all kinds of different ways that we think we've confused with healthy eating. Um, so here are just some of the things that happen as a result of uh, voluntary starvation, a la low calorie dieting. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. Um, so something happened uh, to this unfortunate PowerPoint. What it really was trying to say was that we've gone, that we veer now between not eating much and eating a lot of non-foods so that the, uh, the malnutrition impact is magnified tremendously. Um, and the effect on the brain is really what I'm here to talk about because the brain is in charge. Um, as someone earlier said, uh, it's, uh, it's um, in control of the, of the rest of the body that's walking around uh, supporting it. Um, and sp the specific neurotransmitters that I'm going to talk about um, are the real problem. Um, our starvation diets have prevented us from building up the mood enhancing chemicals that we were born and designed to make so that we more and more need drug effects specifically from sugar to feel decent for a minute. So let's just talk about them for a second. Um, serotonin, our natural antidepressant, inner sunlight. Um, females just naturally produce quite a bit less than males. And then we diet, and within eight hours, our levels typically go below normal um, levels. Um, the same is true for endorphin, our natural opiate, our natural painkiller, our comforter. Females make a lot less than males do. So if you wonder why um, your partner um, your male partner accuses you of being too sensitive and you accuse your male partner of not being sensitive enough, it's really hardwired. 
um, we don't have a lot of painkiller women. And the more we diet, the less we have, and therefore the more we want to eat, and we are the ones who are uh, struggling the most with our weights. Uh, GABA is our natural tranquilizer, and a lot of people overeat because they're too stressed. And the food will temporarily um, stimulate some GABA activity and make us feel a little bit less stressed. And then finally, up in the right-hand corner, the red uh, neurotransmitter. Um, well, it's a, a family of neurotransmitters, dopamine, L-dopa, norepinephrine, and adrenaline, which give us energy and mental focus. And a lot of people use chocolate in particular for that, but Skittles is, is uh, a big one for mental focus uh, in, uh, in my clinic. Um, so here we are um, with our neurotransmitter deficit, um, pouring sugar in for a few minutes of, of relief. What are we going to do instead? Um, we're going to make more neurotransmitters. The more neurotransmitters we have, the better we feel and the less vulnerable we are to the need for sugar. And neurotransmitters are made only from very specific amino acids found in protein-rich foods. So there are 22 amino acids in total. We need maybe five to restore our, our brains to traditional levels. And we can't get it out of our diet. Why? Why can't we get it out of our diet? All we need is protein. Protein three times a day. Why doesn't that fix everything? Because we don't, we're not interested in protein. We just want sugar <laughs> and starch. <laughs> and uh, so to try and get somebody to eat the very foods that would save their lives is impossible because of the addictive nature of sugar. Therefore, we have to be I do want to make a point because one of the modern diets, uh, vegetarian and, and vegan um, style eating, um, is quite low, prote low in protein. And um, fortunately, we do have some humane animal slaughtering and uh, pasture-fed options, um, the which we found therapeutically are absolutely required, at least uh, initially, in generous amounts. Okay, so we're going to take these amino acids as supplements, as concentrates. We've figured out which specific amino acids the brain needs to make the four appetite and mood regulating neurotransmitters that I just described. And how long does it take for these amino acids to take effect, turn off the cravings, and turn on the positive moods? Literally, I'm uh, 10 minutes at the most at the most. Five is more like it. We do it in our clinic all the time, and we watch people change before our eyes because the amino acid supplementation is brilliant. It, the free form, the amino acids get right into the brain, and literally within moments, uh, the brain is embracing them and creating new neurotransmitters, and the effects are extraordinary um, on both craving and mood. And I'm talking uh, as someone who's been using these amino acids therapeutically since 1986. One of the things that's the most remarkable about them is that over time, um, between three and 12 months typically, um, they create permanent changes in neurotransmitter function. Many people have a genetic tendency to not make neurotransmitters uh, generously. And uh, the presence of these concentrates corrects that. So we're talking about epigenetic process. Um, this, is, uh, this is a study that was done by our hero. Uh, if you don't know about Kenneth Blum, I want you to worship at his shrine, although he's still living. Um, he was a, uh, he is a neuroscientist who um, told the world about the amino acids and said, no other neuroscientist will tell you the truth because the pharmaceutical industry has paid for their research and has required them to keep the facts a secret. 
the facts being that we don't need medication to increase serotonin levels. We just need an amino acid that the brain will Im instantly convert. So he put together a relatively low potency blend of the amino acids that would target all four of the neurotransmitters that affect appetite and mood. And this is what happened. Um, these were people who had completed an optifast year um, and had lost a significant amount of weight. At the end of the year, half of them were put on amino acids blend and half of them were not. And the people who were put on the blend had 70% less cravings and binge eating than the others and they regained 15% of their weight instead of 42%. Um, now this was a very weak blend. I'm not recommending this blend to you, but it was the pioneering effort. And what we can do now is to tailor to ourselves, to our friends, to our clients, to our patients, the exact amounts of these amino acids that are needed. So if we've got somebody who's deficient in serotonin, um, how do we know? We do not know because we did urine testing. Um, I, I want to make a very, very strong point about the drawbacks of urinary neurotransmitter testing for those of you who, who know about it. Um, there are so many uh, erroneous uh, results. But what we do know from cerebrospinal fluid testing and from uh, blood platelet testing, very accurate ways of measuring neurotransmitters, is that these lists of symptoms, this particular one is, is the list of symptoms of serotonin deficiency, are very, very accurate. And when we give this list as a questionnaire to our clients, and it's in the book, uh, in, in both books actually, the, the Diet Cure and the Mood Cure, people identify who they are. They know that they are low serotonin eaters. They tend to eat more in the afternoon and evening because serotonin levels drop. Uh, as the sun drops during the day. Um, and they also have these other, uh, these other traits, typically, not all uh, typically, but many often. Um, insomnia, negativity, depression, worry, fear, low self-esteem, panic, irritability, and hyperactivity. Um, all of these things uh, fall to the side uh, when the brain is fed serotonin building fuel. And what is that? Well, the protein in food converts, uh, is torn apart in the stomach. Um, and uh, whatever tryptophan um, is in, in that beast um, is sent uh, into the body and into the brain and con is converted into serotonin very, very quickly in, in the gut, in the, uh, in the brain, and, and elsewhere. Um, these are the two uh, fuels that the brain can use to make more serotonin and stop that particular kind of carbohydrate craving that gets worse in the afternoon and evening. Some people do better on one than the other. We've found that about 80% of people do equally well on, uh, on them. Uh, there are some differences, and I make a note here, that when insomnia is a major problem, we have um, much more success with tryptophan than 5-HTP. We always recommend that people trial these things at the lowest dose, which is 50 milligrams of 5-HTP, 500 of tryptophan, and raise as needed. If you don't feel anything in 15 minutes, take a second dose. Directions are replete in, in both books. Um, this is someone uh, with a major uh, depression and major high carbohydrate addiction um, who had her brain scanned at uh, Daniel Amon's clinic. Uh, her husband was a friend of, of Amon's. Um, and he told her that uh, she had the cingulate from hell um, because uh, the cingulate is, is the, the archway at the top of the brain with the abnormal white and red bodies in it. Um, so that that's the part of the brain where most of the serotonin is made. And uh, she had major uh, deficits in her ability to produce serotonin. Um, so he suggested that she come to our clinic because we were so good at um, helping people with compulsive eating problems. And she did come. And uh, three months later, 
he took a picture of her brain again. And she um, uh, was completely free um, of both the depression and the compulsive eating, and in fact went on to um, be willing, um, at some price professionally, to um, be the subject of a, an NBC special on alternatives, uh, alternative approaches that was aired all over the country. Um, uh, this is a study that just confirms it, an old study f uh, in, done in the UK, not in the United States. Um, I guess you all know why tryptophan isn't uh, so readily used in this country now. Anybody who doesn't know? Okay. Um, um, tryptophan was the uh, most popular nutrient in the country, particularly favored by psychiatrists because it was so helpful with depression and, and particularly insomnia. Um, and so when Prozac came on the market, the first SSRI, they wouldn't buy it. And um, somehow or another, um, a disreputable um, company in Japan um, made a bad batch and sent it knowingly. They testified in court later. They knowingly sent this contaminated batch to the United States and it killed a number of people and made at least 1,500 people very, very ill, some of whom never recovered, um, although they didn't die. Um, so uh, the FDA stepped in and, and, uh, and asked for a voluntary ban, which lasted for over 10 years from 1989, actually, till 1995, they finally lifted it. Um, so we didn't have ready access to this. Um, in 1997, we got access to 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is very similar, thank God. Um, but now tryptophan is, is available, uh, health food stores on, on the web, et cetera. Um, so this kind of success with the worst kind of compulsive eating, um, sugar binging, the bulimics of the world. Um, we see it all the time. We love having bulimics come to our clinic because it's so easy to fix them. With tryptophan uh, and uh, a bath of nutrients that always include B vitamins, particularly B6. Um, so we've already, we've just taken care of a, few, a huge percentage of uh, sugar uh, addicts. Uh, who eat because their serotonin levels are inadequate. And now we're going to go on to those people who overeat because they need pain killing. They need a treat, they need something to look forward to at the end of the day or at any time of the day. Um, and the, the, the uh, foods that specifically target um, the opiate receptors, um, the, uh, the pleasure centers, um, are sugar again, but also gluten-containing grains, chocolate, and milk products. Um, this is how beautiful our own natural opiate is. But if we don't have enough, we are looking for pleasure in all the wrong places, like this place. <laughs> She's off in dreamland now, but <laughs> where's my... Uh, and, and so how many people here um, are terribly fond of doughy things? Um, if they're going to eat something that they don't think they should, it's going to be made out of dough, right? It's cookie, it's bread, it's pasta. It's, um, uh, these are the kind of people who, when I ask them what kind of ice cream they favor, it's always cookie dough ice cream. Uh, and those are good examples of people who have both a gluten addiction because gluten, when it's processed, converts into a substance called exorphin. It's almost exactly like endorphin. And we get, we literally get a, uh, a morphine-like pleasure experience, which is why we keep coming back. Um, and then there are those uh, who are so addicted to milk products, particularly cheese, which is high in casein. And um, when casein is processed in the body, it converts uh, into something called casomorphin, which is, again, a morphine-like molecule that uh, just can't be beat. Uh, and when you put the two together, 
you have a highly addictive substance. And when you add sugar, as in cookie dough ice cream, you have uh, a triple addictor, and then it also includes chocolate. Um, which has at least four different addictors in it, uh, even without having sugar added. Um, of course, with exorphin addicts um, who are overeating gluten and milk products, typically there are major GI problems and, uh, and, respiratory pr and or respiratory problems that need to be attended to, and it helps to motivate people wonderfully when their IBS disappears and, and so does their food addiction. So how do we get rid of an exorphin addiction, an endorphin-based pleasure addiction, an opiate experience from food? We use these extraordinary, another, uh, we have two options again here. Um, how do we raise endorphin levels within 10 minutes? We use um, an amino acid called D-phenylalanine with or without um, its twin L-phenylalanine. The D-L-phenylalanine is a little bit more um, stimulating for those people who are tired uh, and would also like to get some energy as well as pleasure from their food. Um, and uh, the DPA is entirely, um, is entirely used uh, in the brain to slow down the destruction of endorphin. So presumably, some people destroy their, we, we all make endorphin and destroy it all the time, and some people destroy way too much. This slows that down. It allows the body to stockpile endorphin, to make us, give us tremendous access to, to lots more endorphin so that we don't need to reach out to sugar and milk products and breads and so forth to get that uh, lovely, comforted feeling. Um, and these, again, take, take effect in about 10 minutes. And then finally, uh, what do we do for all the hypoglycemics, um, all the people who can't control their cravings for sweets because their blood sugar has dropped so dramatically? Um, it is, the brain doesn't just need the four neurotransmitters, which it does, but it also needs level glucose. And the brain doesn't store glucose, so it's a job to keep the brain fueled. And, uh, oops. This is the amino acid for this particular job. This is an extraordinary amino acid, um, L-glutamine, um, which we find beneficial in about three minutes because most people will open the capsule, empty it into their mouths. It's, it's a very pleasant tasting. And the whole scenario of hypoglycemia disappears. The irritability, the overstress, the headaches, the cravings, the fatigue, um, and we get this nice, even, strong, grounded sense that uh, eliminates the desperate need for sweets, um, which the brain experiences if the blood sugar drops too low because you haven't eaten recently or you've eaten sweets and then the levels go up and then they're uh, stored in the muscle and you have no access to glucose anymore. There are all kinds of scenarios um, going on all the time to diminish our, our, the availability of glucose to the brain because of the way we're eating. Um, so it, it has many, many other uses. Um, I won't go into it, but it's uh, an extraordinary nutrient. Um, in addition to that, um, we have found that uh, 800 to 1,000 micrograms of chromium taken throughout the day in divided doses along with the glutamine or at with meals um, is uh, uh, tremendously beneficial. There's some people who need both. Many people need both. We're, as a people, tremendously deficient in chromium, and processing sugar depletes us of our chromium stores. It's a real irony. So bringing the chromium back and using the uh, glutamine is uh, very, very helpful. Um, Taking a multi that's very strong in the B vitamins, including biotin, which is another blood sugar regulator, is really important. And there are two multis that we um, have found to be extraordinary for balancing blood sugar uh, in, in combination with the glutamine. True Balance by Now and Glucobalance by Biotics uh, contain high levels of chromium that you need, so you don't have to take a lot of different supplements, plus lots of B vitamins, including lots of biotin. 
Um, so this is a little summary um, about the hardwired nature of addiction. The foods themselves are designed to addict. Low calorie dieting increases our vulnerability. Um, neurotransmitter deficits result from a high sugar, low calorie diet, uh, alternating, obviously. Um, hypoglycemia is a huge factor, but yeast overgrowth and sex hormone imbalances can play a part. And all of these factors in sugar addiction are covered in the diet cure. So get it. <laughs> Would any of you like to um, discuss this, ask any questions? Um, I noticed you uh, listed raw food diets <clears throat> as a modern diet to be avoided. Could you explain that a little bit? Uh, we found that uh, most people who embark on a raw food diet end up um, eating a um, tremendous amount of omega-6 fats, uh, inadequate protein, um, and uh, sneaking uh, sugar and potato chips on the side. Uh, so if it works for you, great. But if it doesn't, don't be surprised. It's not a traditional diet that any culture on earth has ever, has ever espoused. Anybody else? I wonder if you could speak to, uh, for a child, six-year-old girl, I do nutrition counseling, and um, the mom is, we're addressing the nutrition, but I'm wondering about glutamine for a six-year-old child. Would you recommend something like that? I thought of like Jim Nema Sylvester or something like that. Um, well, this, any example is, is a great place to start, and I hope at least one of you will use yourself as an example. Um, but uh, with a child, you always want to start with the, a very low dose. Open a capsule and use a quarter or a third, and then raise it as um, the um, as needed. You know, uh, but how do you know if it's needed? Which amino acid should you give? You were asking about how do you know when to give supplements? Um, in the case of the amino acids, we have these very well established symptom pictures, and uh, uh, page one twenty three in the Diet Cure has all the symptoms of each neurotransmitter deficiency, which amino acid to take, and what doses to start with, uh, and what the average range is of use. Um, so if we've got a six-year-old girl or a 60-year-old girl um, who's craving uh, nothing but um, macaroni and cheese, for example, um, I'd love to give you my macaroni and cheese. This is an 11-year-old girl um, who uh, was brought to us by her mother um, who had, had terrible digestive problems until she gave up uh, gluten-containing uh, foods and milk products, but she could not get her daughter to do it. And um, in fact, her daughter was becoming um, a beast, um, more and more angry and abusive and uh, difficult to live with, um, although brilliant, talented, and wonderful at other times. So she called us and asked us whether we worked with children, and we said, well, what's the situation? Sure, and she brought her over. And uh, uh, I asked the little girl what she was so mad about all the time, and she told me, and I said, um, which, would the two of you look at this little list of symptoms and tell me which cluster of symptoms describes your daughter best? And uh, they both looked, and they both agreed that Low serotonin was it because of the irritability. She didn't sleep well. Um, she craved her macaroni and cheese every night. Um, and she really didn't eat anything much that didn't have uh, both wheat and sugar in it, unless it had wheat and cheese in it. Um, so I said, I don't think that you're actually mad at your mother. I think that your brain is... Um, uh, empty um, in the area that should be making you happy. And I think I have the food that could fill that part of your brain. Would you be willing to try it? And so we gave her um, um, a, uh, in her case, 25 milligrams of 5-HTP, which is our child's dose. It's a very tiny um, life link makes it, um, it's, it, it can be chewed up it, it's neutral tasting. Um, 
and so she chewed it up. She was actually quite cooperative. Um, and uh, maybe five minutes later, she um, got up out of her chair where she'd been sulking and walked over to her mother's chair and sat on her lap. This was progress. Uh, then she whispered in her ear something that I couldn't hear, and then she stood up and sang us a song. <laughs> it was, you are so beautiful in every way, no matter what they say. And we wept. The people in the outer office could hear her. It turned out she was a belter. And uh, anyway, her mother, they were supposed to come back in uh, two weeks, and her mother called in 10 days and said, you know what, we don't need to come back. <laughs> She's fine, and here's, here's the best news, she said, as far as I'm concerned for her health, is that instead of crying and having a tantrum when I asked her to try going off of macaroni and cheese and so forth, uh, she said, okay. And she's been off for almost two weeks, and she doesn't have any more tummy aches. So we saved GERD, IBS, God knows what we saved her from, um, with a little tiny bit of 5-HTP. I'm curious about what companies might you suggest uh, for to to buy um, amino acids from? Well, um, the disreputable company that made the bad tryptophan uh, stopped making tryptophan, so we don't have to worry about them. Um, but in general, um, I prefer amino acids that are made by a company um, called Ajinomoto in uh, Japan, it's a huge, huge, huge company making um, very high quality um, amino acids. Um, and uh, MSG, they're most famous for their MSG, unfortunately, but, um, and you'll see that some of the over-the-counter tryptophan, for example, is specifically made by Ajinomoto, which has been making it for 40 years and never made a contaminated batch, has distributed all over the world all this time that the ban was going on in the United States with no problems. So, um, but to tell you the truth, we have been using, other than a, a tryptophan, which we always get uh, Ajinomoto sources, um, for example, Montif uh, probably makes the purest um, amino acids uh, possible. Their, their concern for purity is extraordinary and the founder of the company uh, really is another hero who introduced amino acids to to the world, uh, to the United States anyway. Um, but we have been using uh, other, other sources um, and not finding any difference, uh, other than tryptophan, but tyrosine, uh, DLPA, DPA, um, many different companies um, sell them and get them from different manufacturers uh, and we find them to be equally potent. Um, uh, Amino acid supplements are made from yeasts, so there's something that even vegans will eat, and it's a lifesaver for them since they're not getting enough protein at all. Um, do you have your hand on your head, or are you? Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. Did you have? <laughs> this is a very general question. Some doctors tell you to take medication with meals, some say before meals. Recently I had one doctor say, take it at night before you go to bed. When is the best time to take medication? Oh, I don't know about medications. They vary quite a bit. Um, for example, somebody taking ADD medication would never take it at night. Um, they'd never sleep. They don't tend to sleep very well anyway. Uh, but in terms of amino acids, generally between meals like up to about 15 minutes before a meal and uh, an hour or more after a meal. Since, uh, since chocolate is a good source of phenylalanine, is the problem with chocolate the sugar in it or what's the problem with chocolate? Well, there are so many. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it has, uh, in addition to the um, it has an opiate-like um, content. It has a stimulant. Um, so uh, 
and in addition, it's always combined with some sort of sugar, um, which can affect all the parts of the brain uh, in a potent way. And usually there's milk in it, right? Most chocolate is milk chocolate. And so you've got four different addictors going on in one piece of chocolate. if you alluded to this earlier, but um, how do you determine if you're going to recommend 5-HTP or tryptophan to someone? We, we ask people whether they have um, serious um, sleep problems. If they do, it's more likely that 5-HTP will make those problems worse, whereas we, we almost never see that with tryptophan. So that's the primary thing. But we always individualize, and that's what we encourage, I encourage readers to do, is try it. See if you feel wonderful in 10 minutes, great. Or if you feel semi-wonderful, then take a second one until you actually feel complete relief from the appetite and mood problems that you're experiencing. Um, and if you don't like the way you feel on 5-HTP, then switch to tryptophan. Or if you start with tryptophan, switch to 5-HTP. Could you use both? Usually you wouldn't need to because they do you know, such an identical job because 5-HTP stands for 5-hydroxy tryptophan. Yeah. Do you know an upper limit for glutamine intake? I don't know an upper limit for glutamine intake uh, because I know dietitians who work specifically with AIDS patients who use 50 grams a day and they eliminate the diarrhea that, that kills so many AIDS patients. Um, but the average uh, amount of glutamine needed to stop the, sh the uh, hypoglycemic cravings for sugar is two capsules, 1,000 milligrams. Some people need three. That's usually between meals two, uh, three to four times a day. Some people need it at bedtime so they don't wake up craving in the night because their blood sugar dropped. Yeah, assuming you're doing everything right, uh, how much fruit should you be eating, and is there any fruit combining that you should do? Uh, my second part of the question is I'm a PE teacher, middle school, and where, half my kids do not fall inside the healthy fitness zone. In other words, they are unfit. Where do I start? <laughs> uh, well, Please help me to spread the word that you can rescue your child from the cravings for the junk by feeding that child protein morning, noon, and night, and other whole foods. But protein has to be in there in order to fuel the brain so that the neurotransmitters will start emitting the signal, oh, I don't really want that whole Coke, or I'm not even interested, I really want that you know, sandwich or whatever mom made for me. Um, the kind of things we ate in the 60s um, that satisfied us. But I think regulation is also going to be another part of it. But I just want to stick with the biochemistry today. Oh, the amount of fruit. Again, it has to do with the individual. If you have an apple and you can't stop and you have to have a peach and you have to have an, a banana and you have to have an orange, you can't have fruit for a while because it's too sweet for you. It's triggering that compulsion. So you want to turn off the compulsion with the amino acids and then eat as much as you need. We, we recommend uh, three pieces a day, um, but some people need less. I think adults <laughs> have given up their relationship with their children and allow their children to pick out their diets. I think that's the number one problem because the family is broken down and they sit and watch TV and eat pizza and crap. Well, it's broken down, but I think a lot of it is that the parents are eating through the kids. You know, oh, it's there. The parents' excuse to eat this stuff too because they're so addicted. Um, this this uh, addiction doesn't uh, play favorites. Adults, children, people of all ages, sexes, whatever. I'm puzzled. You talked about uh, addiction to fat, whereas. As far as I can tell, most people probably don't eat enough fat. Can you say more about that? Oh, I agree that they don't eat enough fat. That's why I was saying that, that part of our current form of dieting, which is to eat low-fat 
is a disaster for us. We need to go to traditional fats. We need to go back to butter, ghee, coconut, palm, uh, the saturates, and I explain how safe and healthful they are in this book so, and reference it so that if you've got people questioning you, oh, saturated fat, no, you, you'll see um, how well documented their safety is. And if there's a traditional food in the world, it's fat. Would you kindly speak to the young parents who aspire to give their children the power bars in place of a meal? Well, power bars are mostly sugar, so um, they have to be out. No more sugar. That was easy. Um, it's, um, it's 25 of 10. Um, what, what are we doing here about time? Two more questions? Two more questions? Okay. Who hasn't asked a question? Um, I had a couple questions. You mentioned um, two, um, True Balance and then one other supplement that was um, good for people with sugar issues. And my other question is, do we have to worry all about, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, but I can't talk without the microphone. Do we, do, we ha do we have to worry at all about amino acids competing with other amino acids for absorption? Glucobalance by Biotics was the other multi that, that's so good for stabilizing blood sugar. Um, and uh, the reason that we take these individual amino acid concentrates away from food is that so that the other amino acids in food won't compete. So that these aminos will get right into the brain with no competition from the meal. Okay, last question. Uh, I work with um, DBS Labs and uh, Dr. Madians, and he's used a lot of his amino acids, usually in a 10 to 1 ratio, like L-tyrosine um, to the 5-HTP, and he does the indirect urine measurements from the kidneys with these different um, amino acids, and he gets really good results. And I've also seen your work and your clinical results as well, so I'm, I see both ways working, so what's your take on that? Thank you for asking that. Um, does anybody else know about this raging debate among the amino acid aficionados? Um, <laughs> in the U.S. Um, about whether we have to take, everybody has to take tyrosine along with their 5-HTP if they're going to take 5-HTP or tryptophan. Um, and um, the, um, the, we have found that um, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to our brain chemistry and that each one of us is perfectly capable of individualizing exactly which nutrients we need. Tyrosine is very stimulating. Tryptophan is very calming. For someone who is low in serotonin, they're usually overstimulated and they don't need any tyrosine, thank you, because they're already compulsive and obsessive and hyperactive and having a difficult time slowing down and relaxing. And that's what we want them to have is the tryptophan or the 5-HTP, which is gonna allow them to relax and slow down and smell the roses and feel that inner sunlight, uh, see the positive side of things. Um, what, there are other people who have ADD and they're low in serotonin. So the ADD people need a lot of tyrosine to get that mental energy and focus going, um, but they have a hard time sleeping um, because they don't have enough serotonin. So we give them tyrosine in the morning and we give them 5-HC or tryptophan in the afternoon and evening. So they don't compete, but they get what they need. Um, so uh, I, I'm just finding that doctrine and urine testing um, can lead us astray. Um, and we need to really stick with the clinical picture. And if, if we give people a mixed amino and they do well, great. But if they don't do well, pay attention. So many of these urine testing labs just say, if somebody doesn't do well, give them more, um, which is kind of like giving people antidepressants and uh, when they become suicidal saying, well, I guess they need more. Um, so we have to be very careful with these brain nutrients to, to really be sensitive to the brain response that uh, we're targeting. So thank you very much.
I'll tell you what, you know, this is a wonderful talk, it's re and this is a very important topic, and I, it's so wonderful to have it. I just want to put in a plug for what we're doing, because, you know, this is a very good example of the kind of medicine that Linus Pauling recommended, which is to find out what natural chemicals are important in your body, and to find out which of those are deficient, and then replace it, and eliminate that deficiency, and thereby solve the problem. And that's exactly what we can do with amino acids, and your, your, your research is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, go with it. And, and it works like gangbusters. Oh, I'm a former patient, I guess. And it works. It, it's it's uh, it works long term. It's a more or less permanent um, a change in your biochemistry. And I just want to uh, say that in public to, to encourage anybody who's thinking about it to give it a try because it really does work. I didn't pay him. <laughs> Are we still? Like, yeah. Well, you know, the interesting thing about biochemical deficiencies is when you find the right, when you find out what the deficiency is and you fix it, it's amazing how quickly you get a response. It's just amazing. I, I could give you lots of examples, but the evening is long. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see you, especially the new people. I hope you get the concept.